Welcome, everyone. We will give everyone just a few minutes to get logged in, and then we'll get started. Thank you all for joining. We're just giving everyone just another moment before we'll get started here. We have a packed agenda and a lot of excitement for this first session. Um, just a little housekeeping item with the CE. We did get approval for CE and we'll have a CE for the remaining events here. Um, for your CFP CE credit, uh, there are two requirements. The first one is that you have to attend 50 minutes, five zero minutes of the presentation, and it is only for live attendance. And then the second thing is at the end of this presentation, we have a survey that it will ask for your CFP ID number or your CFP ID for you to uh, submit that to get that CFP CE credit. So those two things, 50 minutes and uh, submitting that number at the end when you have that survey pop up, those are the two requirements, and we will get that submitted for you. Um, with that, I will pass it over to Justin, and we'll get started. All right, great. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll remind you about the CFP stuff at the end, hopefully. I'll try to remember. Um, and if you have questions along the way, there is a Q&A um, option on your toolbar. So please um, submit your questions. We'll try to leave some time for the end and upvote any questions you'd like to see uh, answered, because we will almost certainly not get to all of them. Um, if you have specific questions about, you know, a, a case you're working on in Income Lab software or something, um, we'll try to um, get to those uh, independently um, with you as Justin, well. So we won't leave you uh, hanging there. Justin, I'm going to yeah. hop in just one second. And this is recorded. We'll be sending out the recording. And you can register for all of our upcoming sessions on our website. We have all of the links and in the emails that we send out. So you can go to IncomeLab.io or IncomeLaboratory.com and go find uh, the blog post. And we have the webinars listed there as well. So there you go. Perfect. All right. So welcome, everyone, to the, our first of six master classes on retirement income planning with Income Lab. Um, in future sessions, we'll just jump right in. But since this is the first one, I want to just go over kind of the goals of this, this master class. And there's really two, two parts of the goals, um, theory and practice. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about kind of what retirement income planning is ideally in an advisor's practice and for, um, for a client, what it can actually do for them. Um, the realities of, of the experiences that people have in retirement and income planning, um, ways that you can differentiate your practice uh, through retirement income planning, and a lot more. And so the, the breakdown is it's kind of in two parts. So the first three sessions are really focused on the retirement income planning part of it surrounding spending. So how much can someone spend? Uh, what what might their experience look like, how to talk with clients about that question of what can I spend and what adjustments would I make, um, how to um, build it into your practice, building plans, monitoring plans, managing plans, and so on. And then in the second half, we'll get to some more specialized areas, especially tax smart distribution planning, which is a huge, a huge area. Um, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about kind of talk, meeting clients where they are, talking with them in, in ways that they uh, they can understand, and finally, uh, building your business with centers of influence. So you can see it's every two weeks, um, except for uh, one case where it's, where it's a three-week break. Um, we'll end just as summer truly begins, uh, and uh, really excited to have everybody on the journey with us. Um, so I want to start out by, um, by welcoming my, uh, my, Partner in crime here, my my co-host of the uh, of of the masterclass, Jason Jewell. 
Um, Jason Jewell is a partner and wealth advisor at Carson Group. Um, and, you know, he's he's um, a big part of this masterclass because he really specializes on income planning, tax planning, and so on. Um, I know Jason uh, will tell us a little bit about his uh, his practice here in a second, but just to, uh, you know, give you some of his accolades. Uh, Jason has his RICP and AIF designations, and he was named to Ford's Best in State Wealth Advisors list in 2022 and 2024. He's also a 2023 uh, Advisor Hub Next Gen um, advisor to watch. Um, and Jason has a lot of experience as an advisor. He's worked with lots of clients over the years. And what I love is kind of his, his real focus on the lives people really live in the real world and, and the experiences that they have and the effect that planning um, and working with clients has over time. So hopefully we'll get uh, we'll get into a lot of that today um, and going forward. Um, but Jason, uh, we'd love it if you could take a second to just tell us a bit about yourself, um, you know, why you became a financial advisor, why you're so passionate about income planning, and a, a bit about your practice. Absolutely, yeah. So 2006, 2007 was really my motivation and, and why that date's relevant is unfortunately during that time, my parents were misguided uh, by a financial advisor. And so, you know, it cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars off their retirement, delayed their retirement by years. And so I embarked on this journey uh, in the financial industry. And so since that time, I've worked with about 1,500 clients, uh, three, three different firms, and ultimately seen kind of array of advice and how advice is delivered. And so about six years ago, I changed my focus from helping anybody and everybody, whether they have $5,000 or $50 million, to focusing on those who are in or nearing retirement, that decumulation phase, which is ultimately going to tee us up really for the next uh, you know, couple months here as we embark on this, this six uh, series journey. And so currently serve about 275 families and manage a little over 550 million assets under management. Perfect. So yeah, as you said, that focus on um, on retirement income planning really gets us into this uh, this first session. So this first session is a little higher level um, and it, it really is kind of trying to set the groundwork, the foundation for what we'll do in the next, especially the next two sessions, which we'll get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts and um, really make, you know, put the master in master class. Um, but uh, we want to start by kind of setting up what what retirement planning is all about and and really why it's so hard, um, both for clients and advisors. Um, so Jason, uh, we'll start by um, kind of get, getting your thoughts on this. So from your point of view, having worked with so many clients, what what are some of the most important differences between accumulation planning and retirement planning? Yes, yeah, such a great question. And one, one we talk about often. And when you think about accumulation, that's ultimately growing your wealth, right? That is, that is saving, that is investing, and ultimately having enough money at, at the end of, or at, at on your retirement in order for you to be able to, to fund the lifestyle that you desire. And decumulation is ultimately the opposite side. And when you think about it, decumulation is living your wealth. So how do you use these resources to fund your retirement, to do the things you want to do when you want to do them? And the way I think of it is accumulation, that's wearing our hat forward. Decumulation is wearing our hat backwards. So by the way, that's a complete 180. And we need the appropriate tools uh, to deliver this message to retirees. And the tools that I've used in the, in the past were more accumulation oriented. And I lacked access to decumulation oriented tools, which is ultimately why we're here today. Yeah, that uh, the, the point about, you know, you talked about growing your wealth versus living your wealth, hat forward versus hat backward. We're going to get more into this, but I hear so many stories of how hard it is for clients to make the shift. So why why is it so hard for clients kind of psychologically to start living their wealth? Well, I think really there's there's a couple reasons. Number one, we have deeply rooted financial experiences and beliefs. And number two, inertia. 
So how are those how are those two things related? Well, we graduate from from college, quite possibly. We embark on our career. We start saving money. We start investing money. We start growing this nest egg with the idea of us living out retirement. And we we are saving, investing, and growing our assets for an extended period of time. I mean, we're talking decades, right? Most people work for 30 plus years. And so you have 30 years of deep-rooted experience in saving, investing, and making these sacrifices. And then you make it to the, to the summit and you throw your hands in the air and it's kind of the finish line or what I like to call ultimately the, the next book in the series. And now we get to enjoy retirement, enjoy some of the fruits of our labor and those sacrifices. But the challenge is we've been saving and investing for 30 years and we've got this, this momentum, this inertia moving in this direction. Now we're retired and we need to use these resources to replace our paycheck to pay ourselves in retirement. And it's just, it, it makes it retirees who have been saving and investing, they've been very frugal. When they make it to retirement, they almost tighten up their purse strings by two, by five, by 10. And that's the challenge is pivoting from the saving inertia to now using our resources to live the life we deserve. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I, I've heard people talk about it as, you know, you you you've got really well developed saving muscles, you know, like you're you you've been nailing that. You've been training and saving your whole life. And then suddenly somebody says, just just kidding, now spend. And those muscles have totally atrophied. Um it's uh I know you have a lot of stories that we're gonna get to about the effect of helping people um you know kind of have permission to spend and live their life and kind of hit their goals um but before we get to that um i know that you make this a, a focus of your practice now um and, and you believe that's a, a differentiator for you I, i'd love to hear a little bit about how you you know frankly use your focus on retirement income planning to to stand out from the crowd as a as a, as a business yeah, my experience is our clients want to live life without regret. I think that's really powerful. Um, you know, how many folks have we talked to that maybe lived a very long life, but yet didn't fulfill some of their lifelong bucket list items, the trip to Europe, um, or, you know, the family vacation, what have you. And so I think the challenge is with advisors, we have all of this information at our fingertips. We have all of this knowledge in our head and we want to share that knowledge. And typically we share that knowledge in a very technical delivery when it comes to retirement. What I have found is clients are a little, they're less interested in the, the technical facets of how you're going to generate the income and those particular details. And it's more about them wanting to be heard, them wanting to be understood, them and their desire to have a conversation with someone like me and my neighbor in my garage drinking a beer, right? And they want it to be very conversational in nature. And there are so many fears around them running out of money or overspending their assets, that oftentimes it results in them underspending their assets. So that goes back to the phrase I said earlier, and our clients, does they really wanna live their best life without regret, but they need the confidence, they need the tools, they need the guide to help them throughout this journey to, to give them the confidence that, that they are living the life that they deserve and, and can. Do you have any, um kind of best practices or, or suggestions for, you know, the, the advisors on this call to, to get there, to put yourself, you know, to be able to communicate at that level? It's, it's getting comfortable being uncomfortable. So what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is I used to believe as an advisor, I wanted to portray this image to my clients. I wanted to be the expert. I wanted to be philosophical. I, I just had this vision, right? We all have, you know, maybe um, 
YouTubers that we follow or podcasters that we follow, Tony Robbins and his passion, his delivery. And I wanted to try to recreate uh, this image. But the reality is I, I, I am myself and I need to be true to myself. And if I can get comfortable being uncomfortable, be vulnerable with my clients, help them understand that I, I too have had financial struggles. Right. I graduated college making thirty four thousand a year with seven hundred dollars a month student loan payment. I get it. I understand the pain. I understand the challenges, the adversity that we face. And retirees are facing a huge adversity. And retirees are facing a situation where they're about to embark on a journey they've never experienced before, moving from work life to retirement. And work life is very comfortable for them. Retirement, there are so many unknowns. How are they going to replace a paycheck? Right? They've been working for their company for 20, 30 years. They've been getting a paycheck every month. That paycheck goes away. How are they going to replace their paycheck? When's the optimal Social Security election age? How do pensions come into play? And at the end of the day, based on market volatility, how's that going to impact their income? And I know we're going to get into a lot of that, but that's really the core. The core is sharing your personal vulnerability of how you've dealt with certain financial situations. And if you're uncomfortable with that, use your client examples, the clients that you've helped through retirement, the pain that those retirees felt when they left their work. And now when they're in retirement, how it's very difficult from a financial standpoint and a psychological standpoint. So that vulnerability, I think, is really important. That's a great tip. Probably a great tip for life. Um, so we're going to shift now to um, a little bit of a, our, our first kind of theory uh, section here, which is um, going to guide us into the into the next part. So so now we're going to talk about the shift um, that you made, um, kind of from a more accumulation based uh, way to do retirement planning um, into something that, you know, kind of meets clients more where they are around what you've already mentioned a lot of this, you know, what can I spend? Um, how would things change and so on? Um, so, you know, as we start that, um, you know, kind of the, I don't know, received wisdom on how to do retirement planning, the the um, the main way most people do it is with this uh, this thing called probability of success, which is a you know a way to score a uh, financial plan here specifically a retirement plan. So we'll start with a silent poll. If you use probability of success, you know maybe jot these down on a on a piece of paper in front of you. Um, what probability of success do you target when you're developing a new retirement plan at retirement? So all of the uh, participants answer that to yourselves. And then imagine there's a market downturn and you are refreshing that plan, rerunning it, and the probability of success level is going down. Um, you know, maybe it, you know, it's down by 10, 20, 30, 40 points. During that downturn, when do you think your clients would start to get worried and possibly a different number? When would you start to get worried for your clients? So just hold those, hold those answers and we'll get back to them. Um, okay, so... Let's start out with kind of some evidence around in retiree goals. Um, there's a lot of survey data on this. Um, also, you know, at this point, I've talked to, you know, probably thousands of financial advisors, definitely hundreds in depth, um, about their experiences with retirees, what their goals are, and so on. And they very consistently line up this way, that the most important goals when people visualize retirement you can kind of sum it up in live the best life I can. Um, there are, so that's sort of the positive end of it. You'll hear the negative side of it too, which is, well, I don't want to be a burden on my kids or I don't want to run out of money, um, which of course you, you would think are probably part of living the best life I can. Uh, they don't mean I want a miracle to happen and now I can you know, fly private jets if I can't already afford that. What they mean is I want to do the best I can with what I have and the life I get to live and the world I'm living through and so on. So there's a there's a reality based part of this, but it is. Yeah, let's let's kind of, you know, quote unquote, optimize. Let's do the best I can. That typically involves, especially early in retirement, kind of a, you know, vacation stage, sort of a you know bucket list. It, it all will often throughout retirement involve experiences with a spouse, a partner, kids, friends. 
uh, and so on, building up, uh, sort of building your legacy while you're alive, right? So having these experiences um, and having these memories that, you know, when, when you, you know, at the end of life, someone will look back and say, oh, I'm so glad I did that. Um, interestingly, very low on the list tends to be leave money behind when I die, by which I mean, I, it's very rare to find someone who can actually name and really, really wants a particular number to appear on their statement when they die. People understand there will be money left uh, because they don't want to run out of money, but I often hear this, well, whatever's left is left kind of concept. Or people, you know, especially because of the, the, the popularity of the book, die with zero, they'll say, you know, I want my last check to bounce. Not something you can actually make happen because we don't know when you're going to die, but I get it. That's the point is to kind of live the life you um, you can afford. Um, so that is probably why I, I've heard a lot of advisors talk about having had this conversation, uh, maybe especially early in in their career, uh, you know, somebody's at retirement, they're getting near, that's kind of the new focus of your relationship. And you say, okay, so, uh, you know, how much would you like to spend in retirement? And the client will just say, well, what can I have? Because think about it. No one's ever asked a 30 year old, you know, who's, who has a job, well, how much would you like to spend this year? No, they start with what do we have? How are we going to use that? How much should we save? What, you know, what should go here and there? But but there's already an implied amount you can afford. So to hit retirement and suddenly pretend like, no, it's a, it's a blank slate, whatever you want, let's talk about it. No, the, the client is looking to continue living the, the life they've already been living, which is, well, I, I want to know how much I can afford. I knew when I was working, now I need you to tell me that. Um, and so that's why one of the key places you can meet a client is in not asking how much you would like, but in saying, you know, we need to work on figuring out how much you can afford. And there's a lot of ways to do this. Historically, uh, people used just regular calculator type math, time value of money, straight line appreciation math. This is actually still used in a lot of big firms. Um, and uh, it, it essentially gets you to what you could call a best guess or a most likely answer to what someone can actually spend. So you you take a look at, you know, what kind of resources do we have? How do we think the world will work? So, you know, we have some assumption about an average rate of return in this case. Um, and because that's your best guess at the rate of return, you're going to get the most likely or best guess amount you can spend. So, for example, if I had a million dollar portfolio and I, you know, as an advisor thought a 5% annual average return was, uh, was a good assumption, uh, 360 months, 30 years, I, I would just, I would know you can spend 53.50 a month, right? So I, now I got to the, the best guess, the most likely amount you can spend. Now, for those of you who, you know, have moved past, um, kind of straight line appreciation and you understand that there's a lot more complexity in the world. Uh, typically people don't, you know, if they have much more than just a portfolio, they'll have social security, they'll have some other things. We know there are risks in the world, so returns will vary, inflation will vary, uh, mortality will vary. There's a lot of unknowns out there. And so people moved to more of a simulation based approach to figuring out how much can someone can spend. And if I did a simulation, Monte Carlo or historical, um, I would find that what I'm doing is imagining the way the world could work for you in the future. It could be high inflation, low inflation, high returns, low returns, a mix of all those things. And for each of those possible ways that your retirement might go, there is an amount of spending you could have. So when we're trying to answer this question of like, what can I spend? We're looking at, well, in this situation, you could spend this. In this situation, you could spend that. If I line all those up and I get kind of a distribution of possible spending, which of these levels is the quote unquote, most likely amount someone can afford to spend? Well, it's it's right here, right? By, by definition, I mean, it's both, it's both the most common in terms of the highest, and it's the point at which half the time you could spend more, half the time you could spend less. This would be the place uh, that you know you're most likely to to be right. Doesn't mean you will be right, but you're most likely to be right. Um, 
Now, back to probability of success. If if instead of just viewing this kind of conceptually, we ask, oh, okay, so so this amount of spending, what's the probability of success of that spending? It's 50 by definition. It's the amount of spending where half the time you could have spent more, half the time you actually should have been spending less. That's what that is. So the most likely spending level is the one that has a 50% probability of success. Now, where is 100% success on this graph? It's way over here. It's by definition at the very left side. It's the point at which um, in every single scenario, which you, you know, based on your assumptions is representing the way the world could work. In every single scenario, this client could have spent more and still hit all their goals. They could have not run out of money. They could have, you know, taken that vacation to Europe. They could have, you know, hit and paid off their mortgage. All of the, the parts of their plan, they're saying, hey, 100% success means, uh, 100% sure you're going to be underspending. So if the best guess is at 50 uh, and the 100% success is, is the, the minimum, the lowest level I can even imagine you having to spend, what we're saying with probability of success is um, you will be underspending. We believe you will be underspending and by potentially quite a bit. So the problem here is that the word success already means something to clients and advisors. We just went over it. It means living the best life you can. Uh, but probability of success uses the same word, but it doesn't mean the same thing. It means spend as little as possible. Spend at the very lowest end of the range. And by the way, be worried while you do it because success is the kind of thing that has an opposite, which is failure. So if you give somebody a 90% probability of success, you're giving them 10% failure, and that is scary. It just is. The problem here is like an optical illusion. If I show you these lines and ask you which is shorter, I guarantee it's the lower one. But go ahead if you want, measure it on the screen, um, or you can take my word for it. They're actually the same length. But just knowing that, even if you measured it, get out, get out a ruler and do it, just knowing that does not change the fact that your eyes and your brain make you think the lower one is shorter. You just will. It's the same with probability of success. You can't convince someone that 60% success is better than 80. You can't convince me that, and I, I live this stuff every day. Um, we, in other words, probability of success can't be saved. It needs to be abandoned in, uh, because it's forcing people toward regret and underspending. Um, essentially, if we know that these are retirees' goals, the ones on the left, we need uh, a tool, a practice um, that gets us toward those goals. Um, the problem is that this very low priority goal of leaving as much money behind when you die as possible, that is the goal that probability of success is, is, is pushing you toward, pushing clients toward. It's like having a compass that points south instead of north. It, it's, it's, it's fooling us into thinking that, oh, we're, we're trying to get toward what the client thinks of as success, but it's actually a completely different um, definition of success. And this is the point of, of why uh, in retirement planning that's done with accumulation tools, you end up getting more toward the, uh, the regret zone that, uh, that Jason was talking about. So with that, uh, let's get on to some, com some, uh, some conversation about that kind of um, you know, what uh, triggered you, Jason, to remove probability of success from your process with retirees and kind of what made you made you think this was a this was an important shift to make? Yeah, so there's a couple components there. You know, the one thing that stands out is we live in in a world of gamification. and we we live in a world where we strive for, success. And like you just said, Justin, when we're measuring probability of success and we score a client a 95, that same client, although a 95 is great, they've been trained in their mind since a very young age to score 100, to strive for A's. 
And so therefore, even when their score is a 95, um, and we even show them, you know, we're going to leave behind this nest egg as, as a, a high probability, um, they're still striving for, for that 100%. Now, on the other side, <clears throat> where, where really what spurred me to take the guardrail approach and then and, and leverage income lab was working with a client in 2022. And, you know, we all have those clients who have relatively sensitive plans. And this client was absolutely pursuing their retirement dreams, which we encouraged. And pursuit of those retirement dreams does have to do with the retirement smile, right? Where you're spending more money up front early in your retirement Later in your years, when maybe your health isn't as good and you're in your 80s, you'll have a lull and then you'll have that health event potentially at the end of life. Well, this client was in the early phase of retirement and ultimately their score went from a 90 down into the, the low 70s. And so that caused a lot of pause. And although that wasn't, um, you know, wasn't jarring to me, to them, that was a failure. And immediately the client started to think, how do I need to, what do I need to do? What levers do I need to pull to adjust my score? And ultimately we know that, you know, markets typically recover and, um, you know, as long as we continue to be dynamic and monitor that plan, that score isn't necessarily a bad thing. But when you think about a person and how they monitor their success and measure their success, if a score declines, that's going to be a negative impact. And psychologically, that takes a huge toll. So that's where it made a lot of sense for me to evaluate other tools. And that's where ultimately where the guardrails came into play, which I know we're, we're going to talk about. Yeah, I've heard that story, especially about 2022, although I'm sure it was true in uh, 20, you know, 2009 and so on of this. You know, people get they, they get anchored to their score. It feels like a final exam score, and then they see the score change. And so now you and your, you, you know, your team, it's all hands on deck to get these scores back up when really it's, 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 I mean, essentially it's wasted time because that, that we forced on ourselves because we told people to pay attention to that score. We told them that's the, that's the point. Just make sure that score is high. Um, as you said, we'll, we'll kind of get to that, uh, the, the, how to change how we talk about things. But um, I want to return to just the, the first part of what we talked about the, in the last part, which was that survey data around what retirees want. You've had, as you said, you know, over a thousand clients in your career. Does that ring true to you? And, and, and how do clients typically talk about their hopes for retirement? 100%. What we strive for is for clients to kind of understand the phrase, I'm glad I did versus I wish I would have. So what do I mean by that? Well, last year, at the tail end of last year, um, I actually had half a dozen clients purchase second homes. And so three of those clients were actually still in their working years. Um, and just the level set. So we work with, I work with clients five years pre-retirement through end of life. So decumulation is at the top of mind. We are preaching decumulation, preaching the fact of, um, income replacement of your paycheck in the most tax efficient way possible so you can live the life that you dream. And so what are those dreams? Well, dreams in this case for these six individuals just to own a second home. And the question was, you know, can I afford that home? How do I pay for that home? You know, what's the structure? Should I finance? Should I not finance? And ultimately, we're able to go through a series of, of exercises with Income Lab to flush out all those details. And ultimately, when it comes to retirement planning, there's a textbook answer. And, and that is accurate, but there's also a psychological answer in the client's mind. And so it's important to understand both. And how do we help our clients get more comfortable and move closer to the textbook answer? And in this case, it boiled down to, hey, you've done a great job saving up until this point. The future is bright. You have great confidence to know that this money's going to last you a lifetime. We've all had loved ones and friends that we've lost too soon. And unfortunately, we don't know that tomorrow is guaranteed. And with that front of mind, top of mind, 
that allows us to live in the present and pursue some of those goals today versus kicking the can down the road like many people do. Many of us have done that. We think, oh, I'll get to that. I'll accomplish that goal later when I have more time, when I have more money. This allows us for our clients to live in the moment and be present and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 it's really interesting to, um, to think about, I mean, you've shared with me some of these stories, but people who, who are able to make that shift and um, I think you've said it, um, you know, kind of make, make the impact at the best time. Like if you ended up leaving money to your kids and, and you die in your 80s or 90s, they, they might get it in their 60s. Well, by that point, they're probably fine. You know, it's kind of too late to make a big impact on their life. It's much better if they could get it in their 20s, 30s or 40s. Or maybe it's uh, you're charitably inclined. You know, I've been at some some charity events and things, and I've seen that person, you know, say uh, $50,000, uh, you know, match $100,000. I mean, that's got to feel great, much better than, well, I know when I die, so, you know, my executor will will hand a check off to a charity. Um, those are really, those are the experiences. And then you've talked about this before, but, you know, the the memory dividends that you then have of that experience and it grows and the you know, the, the community around you and so on. So I just think it's such a, it's such a great way to think about retirement as opposed to focusing on the negative side of it of, Hey, let's just not run out of money. Uh, it's easy not to run out of money. Just don't spend anything. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your practice and when, when you kind of decided to get rid of probability of success and shift to, um, uh, this more, you know, what can I spend framing, um, how did you make that transition and what was it like? Well, Justin, I'm going to throw the script out, out the, the door here. Um, and let's just address the elephant in the room. It was, I had a lot of anxiety about making the shift. Um, you know, here I've got a book of about 300 families. So I've got probability success plans that have already been built. And now I'm going to embark on a new process, a new journey. And so like many of you, maybe I had a lot of I had a lot of hesitation and that was around multiple things. Number one, how am I going to find the time, the capacity to build out all these other plans? And then number two, which is maybe even more important, and it's the initial step of how is this information going to be received here? I've been working with these 300 families preaching probability of success for the last decade and now we're not just moving the goalpost, we're changing sports altogether because we're doing away with probability of success. And now we're focused on guardrails. Now we're focused on spending capacity. And so what was really interesting in that process is my fears were not reality. When I delivered the very first plan with Income Lab, regarding guardrails and spending capacity, it was like you could see a weight lifted off my client's shoulders. Because here we'd been tracking their probability success. They're embarking on retirement, this uncharted territory, and they, they don't understand how their assets that they've saved and invested can generate income. And that's ultimately their number one objective in retirement, how do I replace my paycheck? And how much income could I have? How much income do my resources support? And ultimately after the end of that session, even though I could non-verbally see kind of this weight get lifted, once again, I had a conversation like I was with my neighbor having a beer in the garage. And I said, I'm gonna pause there, I've given you a lot of information, curious of your reaction. And it was just, it was this, this love for, oh my gosh, this software is incredible. And, you know, ultimately I said, you know, you're, you're embarking on, on a new journey. We've been using accumulation software thus far, but now you're in retirement. You're turning your head, head around backwards. Uh, some of the processes, some of the strategies are similar, but yet also decumulation is, is very unique. It's very different. We need the software to be able to support you on that journey. And that is, that is the guardrails, ultimate spending capacity. So you, uh, 
so your your fear about how clients would take it was unfounded. It turned out they they loved it. Um, just from a practice management standpoint, um, you know, there there was work to do to transition those clients. I'm assuming you didn't do it all at once. Um, what was that experience like? And on the other side, you know, what's what changes are there in terms of scalability and work for your team um, now that those clients are more on a spending capacity and guardrails uh, approach? Well, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There's work. There's work to be done, right? The way we handled it was, you know, ultimately we we host two reviews with each of our clients. We call them wealth plans. Um, some people call them strategy sessions. Call it what you want to call it two sessions with our clients per year. And as those sessions were coming up, I basically would 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 build an income lab plan uh, and ultimately present that to them at their upcoming wealth plan. So that took some time, um, took some effort. I think like anything, as you embark on a new process, you start to get more comfortable and as you get more comfortable, you get more efficient. And that was very much the case I can build. I mean, I can build a plan in, in well under 30 minutes, um, especially with the, the integration, the aggregation tools. I mean, I could do a base plan for a prospect in 15 minutes. Um, it's not like there's this, this huge time, but we all work with a lot of clients. And so there is this, this issue regarding time and efficiency, and it does take time. Now, what I will tell you is, the scalability was an interesting discovery. What I mean by that is when I use probability success, similar to the client that I referenced earlier, 2022, we had a market downturn. Their score went from 90s to the low 70s. That involved a lot of conversations. That involved a lot of therapy, right? Where we, I was helping the client get comfortable with that new score and giving them confidence to know, hey, here's the levers we're going to pull to make sure that your money is still going to last you a lifetime. And those conversations were more reactive in nature because I had clients calling in um, in reference to their score and the discomfort that came from you know, scores declining. And even those who had scores that declined by 1%, they'd memorialize the fact that they were at 99%, they were 100%. Now they're, now they're 1% less and, and it was causing anxiety. And so as we think about the guardrail system, it sets a precise expectation for the client. There's a phrase I use and that phrase is, Happiness equals reality minus expectations. Okay, so within this framework in retirement planning, how is that relevant? Well, with guardrails, we are setting an expectation. And that expectation is in relation to two components. Number one, it's in relation to current balances. Clients want to understand the marriage between your balances, their balances in their account, and the influence on their income. So the expectation is clearly defined. And that definition is indicated here, as we see before us, we've got a current spending capacity based on current balances. And the client understands that, okay, I've got these two new targets. If my portfolio grows, to X, I'm eligible for Y type of a pay raise. If my for portfolio falls to X, I know this is going to be the influence to my income. And frankly, um, most clients are really surprised to see how the drawdown of their assets might feel substantial, but the impact to their income and the spending capacity as a result is relatively minimal. And so that's really this marriage um, between the balances in your account and the income. And at the end of the day, that's what I found clients care the most about. And so my point of all this is there's a scalability that, that is created because now that clients understand these defined balances and income targets, they're, they're less anxious. They don't call in 
to ask questions because they see a 15% drawdown in their portfolio. Um, and it allows me in turn to be proactive and be able to, to, to reach out to them in advance um, and to be able to prospect more and mm -hmm. to grow the business more, to serve more families. Because isn't that all of our goal? All of our goal is, is likely, if I ask most advisors, what do you like about being an advisor? They would say they like to help people. Well, the, the better, the more people we can serve, the more we're able to help as a result. And that's, that's, that's just, that's, that's ultimately the biggest benefit in my mind is the scalability. And I found that to be, um, it, it, I, it was, it was one component I was not expecting is how it does improve scalability and how the clients really prefer this method, this mechanism and this system. That's awesome. Um, just by shifting their attention away from this score, which unfortunately, like you said, even one a change in one point can can uh, kind of freak people out. So I, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering now, kind of, all right, I get it. What can I spend is the point. Adjustments are part of it. What, what's behind this though? So I wanted to provide not just a, um, you know, some talk about this, but also answer this question. Okay, what, what's the framework that gets us toward this, this goal? Uh, what's the way to think about it? Um, and the nice thing is, I think this is actually already in Advisor's Toolbox. It's just thinking about risk and reward um, instead of only risk. So in a lot of financial decision-making is about balancing risk and reward, right? The higher the risk, the higher reward, the higher the reward, the higher the risk, the lower the reward, the lower the risk. That's just how things work. We are um, you know, very familiar with this, especially in the investment world. So I think most advisors have had the experience or at least heard about the experience of people um, you know, kind of coming in with a 100% cash portfolio. Um, and trying to help them understand, um, hey, we need to find the right balance for you that fits your needs, your goals, and your personality, which we call, you know, um, risk tolerance. Maybe there's some risk capacity, right? But typically, almost no client is best served by being, at, you know, kind of at either end of this uh, of this range, right? 100% cash, or you know, as as risky as you can find. Typically, it is about finding a balance. And so what we're talking about in figuring out what someone can spend and when they should adjust is the same exact thing. It's about balancing risk and reward, but in spending. So, you know, should they be at the lowest spending level I could ever imagine them needing to have? Um, probably not. Should they be at the highest spending level, which if everything were amazing, this were, you know, 1982, we were about to enter a huge bond and, and stock uh, bull market for 20 years. No, probably neither one of these. It's probably about finding somewhere in the middle. As we said, you know, there is a best guess or a most likely spending level. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best advice, because really, you know, below that spending level is the underspending zone. Above that spending level is the overspending zone. Uh, people typically don't weigh these risks equally. Um, they're more afraid of overspending than of underspending. Um, and as in the example Jason was just going through, often it's nice to have a pay cut be much farther away from you to take a bigger adjustment in your account in order to actually have to take a pay cut. And so you may propose spending that is within uh, the underspending zone. Um, kind of turning this on just, just horizontally, um, you'll notice that if you go back to your um, questions to that, that poll earlier, um, Let's imagine, you know, the situation Jason was talking about, you know, you had a plan that was in the 90s, it moves down to the low 70s. Well, that client's anxiety and, you know, Jason's team's work to get the plan back to 90, they're still completely in the underspending zone. There is, this is not a five alarm fire. This is a, you know, we're, we're still actually underspending. Yeah. Have we gotten closer? Have we, have we, you know, absorbed a little bit of our buffer? Sure. But th there's no reason to uh, feel anxious, to really get worried about here, or to make adjustments. If, if as time goes on, a particular spending level, you know, maybe it's $10,000 a month, 
gets less and less risky, it's time to give people good the good news of, hey, let's spend a bit more. If it's moving up, that's okay. We, we will monitor it and, and make sure that at some point we or we might make an adjustment, but it's not, even if it's nearing, you know, 50 here in probability of success, that's, that's not uh, important. We need to be into the overspending zone for that to matter. Of course, you're never going to be able to uh, convince yourself or a client that, uh, you know, 25% success is a good idea, right? Which is why, again, we, we were talking about you, there's the probability of success just needs to completely go away from this picture. And it's more about this. It's more about risk and reward, constantly managing that balance, managing the two risks in retirement, which are the risk of overspending, which we're all familiar with, and the risk of underspending, which is also the risk of regret. It's the uh, it's the risk that, that Jason's been talking about with, with so many clients. Um, so as we get toward the end here, um, I I want to talk a little bit, Jason, about how um, you know this approach um, translates with clients into permission to spend. Are there particular kind of things you say to clients um, that help them really embrace what they are? I think you said eligible for. I like that. Um, and, and understand that, you know, also, as you said, you know, tomorrow is not guaranteed. So I'd love it if you could share a little bit about how you talk with clients and if you have a story or two about that. I do, you know, I do, I do want to acknowledge just kind of planning in general. When I think of financial planning, <clears throat> financial planning really gives our clients confidence that their future is bright, their financial future is bright, that the money's going to last them a lifetime. And in turn, what that allows them to do is it allows them to live in the present. It allows them to live for today in today because we understand that tomorrow isn't guaranteed. And so that brings me to a story. And that story is, is, is a client of mine, uh, a great friend. And unfortunately, he passed away um, in a golf cart accident. It wasn't, it, it's, it was an unfortunate scenario. He was riding on the back of a golf cart where the golf clubs go. Um, it wasn't late at night. They weren't doing any, you know, they weren't, weren't um, doing any daring type things. And they're just driving down the campground and they hit a pothole and lunged him forward. He hit his head on the top of the golf cart. He fell to the ground unconscious, never came back to life. So, that speaks to life is short. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. What I loved about this client and love to this day and still talk to his family about to this day is that they made the most incredible memories together when he was alive. And our relationship was, was unique. And I have a unique relationship with a lot of my clients. Uh, we, we were able to talk very candidly. And so inevitably, um, you know, we had a financial plan in place. We had all the checks and balances in place, and he would come up with some grandiose ideas, like taking his family, his entire family, family five, game seven, World Series, Chicago Cubs. <clears throat> Love it. But I was concerned about the cost. So when he calls in and talks about this, this new dream and memory he wanted to create, Naturally, I defer to the financial plan. Is this affordable? Will it cause any derailment? And the answer was, no, we could afford it. So at that point, it was a matter of what account do we withdraw from? That's going to be the most tax efficient for him to fund this goal. And so fortunately, he did fund that goal as well as a Disney cruise, as well as buying that fifth wheel. Um, and it so happens it was the very first weekend they set up the fifth wheel that his entire family was there that he passed away. But these memories created dividends. The time he spent with his family, taking them to the World Series, taking them to Disney, having this fifth wheel, these memories paid dividends. So even when he was alive, he would get together with his family. They'd be at the dinner table and they'd be rehashing their experiences together, their time together. And after he's passed, those conversations continue. Those memories continue to pay a dividend. And that's, in my mind, that's a legacy. That is a legacy that is going to far exceed and outlive our lifetime. 
And that's, that's what I'm trying to create uh, with my clients and give them permission, um, give them the confidence to know that here are your resources. Here's how much you're spending today. And the reality is here's your spending capacity. So if you had an extra 5,000 a month, which is pretty popular, if you had an extra 5,000 a month in, in a wiggle room, how would you reallocate those dollars? That's awesome. And I, I, I know you have a lot, you shared a lot of stories with me uh, like that, that this is really, you know, let's, let's help clients find fulfillment. I even saw in the, in the Q and A people talking about people, even in their working years are starting to think that way as well, that, you know, you're, you're living now too. We don't have to wait for retirement to live. So I think that's a great point. We have a ton of questions. Uh, some of these we are actually going to hit in the next, uh, especially the next two sessions. Uh, so two weeks from now and four weeks from now. So uh, if if we don't get to them, fear not, we will we'll have these and, and we'll be able to to hit them. Um, I think one that specifically addresses what we uh, went through today uh, is somebody said the income guardrails process looks difficult to implement. Um, could you explain the process you use, how often you evaluate uh, portfolios, make in income adjustments and so on? Maybe just talk a little bit about kind of, you know, is this more difficult than what you were doing before? Um, how does it differ and how did you do it? The difficulty is just building the plan initially. Uh, from there, it's actually more efficient uh, because we're able to focus much of our conversation in meetings just purely around goals. And I might talk performance for two, three minutes. I might talk about markets for five minutes. Much of my meetings are specific to the wealth my clients have amassed and how do I help them live the life that they've dreamt? And how do I give them the confidence to know that they can pursue those dreams and it's not going to derail them financially and that their money will still last a lifetime? And how do I help them get confident around pursuing their goals of maybe a legacy for their children, but thinking of legacy in a different way? And that's through these memory dividends or gifting while they're alive. And when their children likely need the money most and when it will make the biggest impact on their children and for them to be able to view their children um, receiving the benefit. How, how, how great is that? Yeah. Uh, we have a few questions about, I know you really only work with people where retirement is the is the the goal. So maybe you don't have thoughts on this, but people are asking, do you still think probability of success is appropriate for some other phase of life? Um, I have some thoughts on it. I don't know that I have really strong thoughts on it. Jason, do you? I, you know, I think uh, accumulation, the software that I've used in the past, probability success is specifically for accumulators. I would say, um, you know, kind of that five years pre-retirement through end of life is typically when decumulation is front of mind. Um, although I think you could say it's relevant much earlier. It's just retirement is so far away for most folks. They're not really thinking about the decumulation phase yet. So therefore, you know, I don't, I don't know how valuable it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I do think what, you're right. Like telling somebody, Hey, in 30 years, I think you can spend $10,000 a month. Well, I mean, what a waste of time, right? I'm more concerned about, the next couple of years uh, in my early time. Well, I can say that, but at the same time, do I really care that my probability of success of spending 10,000 a month in 30 years is 90? I, I'm not sure that matters much either. Um, on the other hand, I can see an argument that, hey, at least it pushes people toward good behavior, savings, and so on. So um, yeah, I think uh, my jury anyway is still out on whether it's uh, useful at any time. But the point is, if you use probability of success, you are telling people what to pay attention to. So no one is forcing you to use probability of success ever. That's not a requirement of the job, right? So you have to choose the tools that help clients get to their goals, which is, you know, what we talked about. That's why it's so important to understand what retiree goals really are. Um, and that in retirement, probability of success is pointing in the, in the, in the opposite direction from the goals. Um, so with that, uh, Taylor, you want to remind people about some admin stuff? Yes, we do. For those who are looking for CFPCE as well, please make sure you fill out that survey and put your CFP uh, ID in there and um, have attended at least 50 minutes. Those are the two requirements. We'll have that for each of our sessions going forward. 
And then please uh, check out, we'll send out the replay in the slides for this session, but also links for the upcoming master classes, along with keep in uh, mind for those users, we have Lab Talk Tuesday and Retirement Income Intel all this month. So a lot of information we'll be providing you. Um, and then we have this coming up next month as well. So uh, Justin, anything further? Hope to see you all in two weeks. We'll be diving uh, much more deeply into the nuts and bolts of how to build income plans, what things matter, and, and the process around implementing this in a practice. So hope to see you all then. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and the key takeaways. Uh, that... Oh, yeah. We'll be sending out some takeaways as well uh, to, to the to attendees where you with your email address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.